Today, I want to explain why, as a Christian theologian, I am affirming of the LGBTQIA community. What this means to me is that I affirm the rights of such individuals in a social, political, sexual, and theological sense, meaning the right to live, marry, and thrive without repression or exclusion from society or the church. Accordingly, I reject the hardline approach to the LGBTQIA community that is often the default in conservative evangelical churches. Namely, I reject the notion that their sexuality is a sin according to the scriptures. Thus, I affirm their dignity and validity as human beings made in the image of God to be celebrated and welcomed rather than excluded or condemned by the church. Furthermore, I strongly oppose any exclusion of such individuals from membership, baptism, or inclusion into the body of Christ. Thus, I support the acceptance of these individuals in the church, and not merely their acceptance, but the celebration of them as children of God, deserving of liberty and love and fellowship. What this entails a rereading of scripture around a liberating motif, which does not use the text to suppress the rights of disadvantaged individuals, but rather liberates and affirms their common humanity. So this is my stance in brief, and it has been for several years now. Um, With what follows, I want to explain how I have arrived at this conclusion. I primarily want to approach this from a personal point of view. As such, there will be three parts to this video. Uh, First, the theological, where I explain a little bit about liberation theology and how it informs my understanding of the gospel and the importance of social justice in the political, economic, and even sexual sense. Second, I will discuss the biblical text. Um, This was not necessarily as essential for my own journey, um, but I know that any video addresses this must have something to say about the text that supposedly deem homosexuality as a sin. And finally, I will explain a bit of my personal journey and what I think was the most important factor that finally changed my perspective. Now, the reality is I did not always think this way. Um, and I, in fact, for most of my life, I accepted the classic evangelical approach to this question, namely that homosexuality is a sin and against the will of God and that it is forbidden in the Bible and that such individuals must repent and convert. But over the past five or six years, as I have read widely, uh, explored, and rediscovered the richness of my Christian faith, these presuppositions gradually receded into the background. So let's begin with those theological presuppositions that ground my support for the LGBTQIA plus community. But quickly, uh, just let me say for short that sometimes I will refer to this community as the queer community in general. Um, This is not to exclude anybody, uh, but simply for conciseness. The phraseology is sometimes debated, but queer seems to be a general catch-all phrase for this community. Um, And so I use it here to explicitly um, mean those who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning, intersex, asexual, and all non-binary genders and atypical sexual identities. Um, Essentially, anything that is not heterosexual or gender normative is what I'm including here in my affirming stance. So with that said, let's get started. For me, the first major reason why I'm affirming is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of liberation. It is good news to the poor and oppressed. It is a message of liberation. This was the most fundamental shift for me personally, a shift in priorities most of all, but also a rediscovery of the true gospel. And it is also what eventually led me to an affirming position. The realization that the gospel is primarily a message of liberation means that the church and theology should orient itself around the least of these as a priority and not merely as a secondary concern. I have said in another video that for me, the center of a Christian's political ethic should be the command to care for the least of these and that the proof of any political ideology claiming to be Christian is not found in their nominal claims to Christian values, but rather in their concrete actions towards those who might be deemed the least of these in any given society. In short, a Christian is known not by their words, but by their love, and any political ideology that fails to be a force for the liberation of the oppressed is not, in my opinion, worthy of the name of Jesus Christ. Thus, for me, the gospel is the good news of liberation, and liberation here is not merely a spiritual concern, but following Matthew 25, it is material and political just as much as it is spiritual. 
Jesus did not instruct us to simply pray for the thirsty, hungry, and imprisoned in his famous parable of the sheep and goats. Rather, we are told that our failure to feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, and visit the prisoner is a direct failure to love Jesus Christ. This parable is often read as a call for charity, um, rather than a call to reorient our faith around the material concerns for the poor and needy and around their political liberation. And this follows a trend in the West that spiritualizes and individualizes the Christian faith, subjecting everything in the Bible to a strictly evangelical approach that seeks only to save souls while neglecting the bodily and social concerns of the least of these. But Jesus did not define the gospel as a purely spiritual escape. In short, the gospel is not about going to heaven when you die. It is about establishing the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. The gospel Christ proclaimed was not to escape earth, but to realize the kingdom here and now to preach good news to the poor. As Jesus declared in his ministry statement in Luke 4, which is a direct quote from Isaiah 58 and 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. For me, this indicates a theological preference for the poor and needy, or what liberation theology has called God's preferential option for the poor. This is the poor and needy in a material and political sense. It is those who lack a voice or power in society and are accordingly disenfranchised and oppressed socially and politically. Some will say that Jesus' words here are merely a spiritual declaration, that the poor and blind and oppressed are spiritual categories. But I think this is quickly disproven by studying the actual life of Jesus and what he did. So ask yourself this, did Jesus not heal the physically blind? Was he not the preacher who proclaimed good news to the materially poor? Was he not himself materially poor? And did he not harshly critique the rich and send them away? It is a sign of our flawed thinking that we turn Christ's words into allegories for spiritual escape rather than grasping the radical nature of his teaching about the kingdom of God. Of course, there are spiritual parallels here, but it is negligent to overly spiritualize this in an attempt to belittle the material and political concerns of the gospel. An apolitical gospel is antithetical to the gospel Christ proclaimed. This insight is one of the central aspects of liberation theology. My latest book in the Plain English series studied the work of James Cone, who was the founder of black liberation theology. His insights in particular have drastically shaped my perspective. I think liberation theology is correct to recapture the material dimensions of the gospel. It asserts that a gospel that is concerned solely with spiritual well-being without also caring for the material conditions of the poor is not the same gospel Christ proclaimed. Thus, the Americanized, individualistic proclamation of a personal Savior falls short of the teachings of Jesus Christ. Rather, we must adopt a gospel of liberation. Now, this is not necessarily the place to examine all of the intricacies of liberation theology. My book on Cohn is a good introduction to the subject, I think, but um, so is Gustavo Gutierrez's book, A Theology of Liberation. But my point in bringing all of this up is to show how liberation theology informs my affirming perspective. For me, liberation theology is a vital challenge to the church today because it asks us, what good is a gospel that is concerned solely with the abstract spiritual condition of the souls without actually having any concern for the real material and social conditions of real human beings? Such a gospel is simply an opium, a fantasy that escapes the world rather than daring to change it. It is not the same gospel Christ proclaimed. It is also Gnostic, and the message it proclaims is that queer people do not matter to God that their bodies and their sexuality do not matter. But the opposite is true. God cares deeply for the queer community. They are celebrated, made holy, and included in the fellowship of God's love. Their sexual liberation from oppression is just as vital to the gospel as the salvation of souls. Jesus saves the whole person, not just a compartmentalized section of a person called the soul. And furthermore, the gospel does not merely transform the individual, but it is a challenge to society and the world. A great strength of liberation theology is that it takes seriously Mark's 11th thesis on Feuerbach, 
that philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. The same should be said of Christian theology. Theology has often resigned itself to merely interpreting God and the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change the world, to usher in the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. For all the talk of a biblical gospel, the evangelical focus on saving souls is strangely absent from the Bible itself. Instead, there is a much larger focus on God as the liberator of the oppressed in history, as the God who is more concerned with justice than religion. God defined God's self to the Israelites as their historical liberator from Egyptian captivity. It was a central element in Israel's theology and self-understanding as a nation. God was defined as the God who liberated them from captivity. We see this all throughout the Hebrew Bible. The Ten Commandments begin with this very declaration of God's identity. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is ironic how often the Ten Commandments are lifted up in evangelical theology as a central message of the Bible, yet this introductory declaration is so frequently overlooked. God defined God's self as the liberator of the oppressed Israelites, and still today God is the God who liberates the oppressed. In the New Testament, Jesus reaffirmed this understanding of God's historic role in the liberation of the oppressed by his public declaration in Luke 4, but also throughout his ministry. Jesus' gospel cannot be divorced from his emphasis on God's liberating activity on behalf of the poor and oppressed. With this, we arrive at the theological background for my affirming position. Um, If God is the liberator of the oppressed, then by default, the church should be a voice for the downtrodden and outcasted from society. We should side with the underclass, with the poor and disadvantaged. This includes being on the side of the queer community in their struggle for sexual, political, social, and economic liberation. Because our faith centers around the gospel of liberation, our default position should be to support the least of these in their liberation struggles for dignity. What has happened instead is the opposite. The church has often used theological arguments to further repress and exclude the queer community to spew hatred and hostility rather than love and acceptance. Wherever a struggle for liberation is taking place, the church turns its back on Jesus Christ by being a force for repression rather than liberation. Jesus said that his disciples will be known by their love. He did not say they will be known by erudite arguments, by expert knowledge of the Bible, or by correct thinking and church membership. No, it is by their love for the least of these. But today, that has not always been the case. We have reversed the process. No longer is love the priority, but correct teaching. We will address the biblical text in a moment, but for right now I want to stress this point. If the center of our gospel message is liberation, then how can we call ourselves Christians if we exclude the least of these, if we oppress the oppressed, if we reject the outcasts? Now, whatever the biblical texts say about homosexuality, which we will get to in the next section, but whatever they do say, there is nothing that will change the fact that the gospel is a message of liberation, that the church is not called to repress and exclude, but to liberate and include. What has tended to happen, however, especially in the American church, is that a message of repression has taken over the conversation. And the church is now known not as a force of liberation, but of oppression for those who are different. The reality is that queer individuals are oppressed socially, sexually, politically, even today, in spite of their many legal victories. This is not really up for debate. It is a real social condition facing this community. Chronic homelessness, poverty, and high suicide rates plague the LGBTQI plus community primarily because of the social exclusion they often face. And the church is not blameless in this oppression. There's a great YouTube channel called Invisible People, which simply goes to the streets of America and elsewhere and interviews the homeless. Um, Oftentimes, I think we see the homeless simply as an object. um, But this channel um, does an excellent job at humanizing the homeless. Um, I highly suggest that you take the time to watch some of their interviews. Um, They're truly heartbreaking. But also what you'll notice is, if you do watch their videos, that... An overwhelming number of the people they interview share a similar story. The interviewees explain that they are transgender or homosexual, and because of their family's beliefs, 
they were disowned, essentially rejected as members of their own family, and thus as humans, and many of them that ended up on the streets shared that experience. In fact, a study was conducted that showed how queer individuals are more than twice as likely to become homeless for life versus heterosexual individuals. This is a heartbreaking reality and all too common. And all of this is not to mention the more indirect forms of oppression and exclusion, such as various microaggressions that subtly reinforce alienation and promote hostility. A church that not only refuses to see the oppression of LGBTQI plus individuals, but that refuses to help them is not a church worthy of the name of Jesus Christ. Liberation of the oppressed is the center of our gospel and faith, or at least it should be, once again. That is why, no matter what biblical arguments are made, the default of a Christian should be to help the oppressed and support them in their struggles, not to add further condemnation onto them. Doing good works of love are more important than correct theology. Our default must be to liberate the oppressed, and only then should we be concerned with the correct interpretation of the Bible. Now, as a theologian, of course, I care tremendously about correct interpretation, correct doctrine, but my point here is simply that our priorities are out of balance when we fail to see the humanity of oppressed individuals and to see that the gospel compels us to side with them in their liberation struggles. And in reality, there are really only about five verses in the Bible that talk about homosexuality somewhat directly, um, which I'll get to in the next section. But for a topic that has become so central to the conservative evangelical identity, it is shocking to see just how few the texts are that discuss the issue or supposedly discuss the issue. But compare that to the plentiful number of verses that make justice, liberation of the oppressed, and love for the neighbor central, it is clearly that there is an imbalance in our perception. So we have to ask what takes priority here. Clearly, the Bible is more concerned with liberating the oppressed than asking whether or not the oppressed are living in sin. Even if that's true, the priority is still to help the poor and needy unconditionally. Thus, for me, the gospel itself is the first and perhaps central reason why I am affirming. I am affirming of the LGBTQIA plus community because the gospel we proclaim is a gospel of liberation. It is good news to the oppressed. It is the message of God's liberating activity in history, that God is on the side of the oppressed and struggles with them for liberation. The greatest hurdle for most evangelicals to becoming affirming is the biblical hurdle. Here I want to discuss a biblical case for an affirming reading of the texts that are often used against this community. Before we look at the texts themselves, however, I want to stress the need for a liberating hermeneutic. This follows on the back of what I just said in part one. A liberating hermeneutic seeks to read the Bible as a message of freedom, not repression. It is a conscious choice to prioritize liberation. A quote from James Cone summarizes what I mean. To think biblically is to think in the light of the liberating interest of the oppressed. Any other starting point is a contradiction of the social a priori of the scripture. What this means is that there is an unbiblical way to read the Bible. In my mind, it is any reading that divorces individual texts away from the whole scope and context of the scripture, especially from the social conditions of their writing. The Bible is a message of hope for the poor and oppressed. Its message of liberation is central, as we've seen. It is one of the greatest tragedies of modern Christianity that the Bible has become a book of oppression and exclusion rather than liberation and inclusion. But that is precisely what has happened with the evangelical abuse of Scripture to deny the full humanity and dignity of queer individuals in the church. Because of a few isolated texts, An entire repressive apparatus has been added onto the church's witness and teaching, so much so that the church has often been synonymous with bigotry and hatred of the very same people Christ has called us to love and accept. The Bible was written by and for the underclass of history. That is what makes it a revolutionary book. Yet it has been co-opted by the privileged and powerful as a means of control and repression. Harper Lee's character, Miss Maudie, 
in her classic book, To Kill a Mockingbird, said this, Sometimes the Bible in the hands of one man is worse than a whiskey bottle in the hands of another. They are just some kind of men who, who were so busy worrying about the next world, they've never learned to live in this one, and you can look down the street and see the results. I love this quote because it highlights at once the danger and power of the Bible. We can either adopt a liberating hermeneutic that centers around Christ's gospel of liberation, or we can adopt a repressive and exclusive reading of the Bible that spews hatred and bigotry to the other. Now with that said, let's look at a few of the texts commonly used to justify this oppressive approach. I do want to disclose here that I'm not a biblical scholar, and for much of this, I will default to the work of other scholars in the field. This also means that we won't do necessarily a very deep dive into these texts, um, but I will cite resources for your own study if you'd like in the description. Um, What I offer here then is simply a summary conclusion of a much more detailed study into these texts that you can pick up on your own. Um, The source papers and books on the subject should be consulted for more, and um, so you can find those in the description below. Now, with that said, um, let's take a look at these texts and some of the conclusions that scholars have made about them. Now, um, it is often said that the Bible is very clear on the issue of homosexuality. It is said that it plainly condemns homosexuality as such. But as any good student of the Bible will tell you, it is often not so black and white. A plain reading of the Bible is often a misguided one, because such a reading entails injecting our own presuppositions into the text rather than performing true exegesis of the text itself according to its own context and time. Now, as I've already mentioned, there are really only five texts that address homosexuality, and these are Leviticus 18.22, Leviticus 20.13, Romans 1.27, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 1 Timothy 1, 10. Now, sometimes a verse or two from Genesis is offered as additional evidence, um, together with Jude 1. But I think these arguments are typically less substantial than these five main texts, and so we're not going to worry about them as much here. Um, I do link some sources below that deal with those more specifically, if you're curious. Um, Now, for each of these five texts, it's important to remember with all of Scripture Uh, that context is king. So we have to pay close attention to what the author might have intended, and most importantly, in this case, perhaps what the author did not intend with these verses. But most of all, we must keep in mind a liberating hermeneutic as our general framework. One important clarification that scholars have made regarding these texts is this. We can reasonably argue that these verses do not forbid homosexuality as such, but merely forbid particular cultural homosexual acts that are defined by the immediate context of each verse. There is no indication that the authors of these texts mean to condemn homosexuality as a sexual identity within the confines of a loving consenting relationship. Rather, the context seems to imply that only some specific culture and time-bound act unique to that era is being condemned. Thus, what we think of as homosexuality today cannot be easily read back into these texts without doing violence to the texts themselves. Or in other words, we cannot read our own assumptions into the text by thinking that what is meant in these texts is the same as what we know of today as homosexuality. So by injecting this image into the text and thus using them to ban all such minority sexualities, conservative evangelicals have committed the first sin of biblical interpretation, failing to pay attention to historical context. Today, homosexuality primarily exists in relationships based on mutual love and respect. But as we will see, that is not the case for most, if not all, of these texts. Historically, the authors of these texts would have had no knowledge of such relationships, and we can make a strong case that these texts are addressing cultural acts that we are no longer familiar with today. In short, we are not talking about the same thing that these texts are talking about. Thus, the direct question of whether or not homosexuality is itself sinful is not anywhere addressed in the Bible. Only specific, culturally and historically unique acts are being discussed in these verses. And that clarification is vital for disarming these texts, 
we cannot so easily translate what's being said there into today's world. And I think that's the big mistake that a lot of conservative evangelicals do when reading these texts, is they make the naive assumption that what they're talking about and what the authors are talking about are the same thing. And I think any good scholar will tell you that we cannot make that assumption, that that's a naive assumption and it's an unscholarly assumption. Because at the end of the day, we have to understand the context as the authors understood it, not how we think it should be understood today. And so we then have to ask ourselves of these particular texts, what are the acts that are being condemned by these verses? And so for that, let's look at the texts themselves. In both of the texts in Leviticus, there are a few things to notice. First, there is a strange grammar to the text, which literally would translate like this, and with a male shall not lay lines of a woman. This seems to indicate not general homosexuality, but a particular situation, which is why the scholar Robert Ganus makes a strong case that the author is condemning either the act of cultic prostitution or perhaps pedophilia. The other prohibitions listed alongside this verse give context for this, since the grammar of the text itself is a bit ambiguous. The surrounding verses are prohibiting activities that were common among the Canaanites, particularly some of their religious rituals. That is why a case can be made that this is a specific prohibition of temple prostitution rituals of the Canaanites, not homosexuality as such. Furthermore, the Hebrew word used in one of these verses is not male in the sense of an adult male, but rather of a boy, and thus the implication seems to be pedophilia. And finally, it's important to notice how this text does not mention anything about female homosexuality. It only discusses the male. And while some have argued that this is just simply an oversight, it seems unlikely given the directness of the surrounding verses. Immediately prior to this prohibition, the text forbids both male and female bestiality. Why would the text be so specific in that verse but not in this one? Especially if the anti-gay reading is correct that this is a blanket condemnation for all time for all types of homosexuality. It makes no sense for it to then overlook the female equivalents. So the conclusion here is that the Leviticus text is not as clear as we have been led to believe, and that when we take the context seriously, we realize that it is extremely ambiguous at best. And all of this is without mentioning the argument that because this is part of the Jewish law, Christians are not obligated to follow it. And for this, all we need to do is remember Paul's argument in Galatians against circumcision. And thus, the verses in Leviticus are not an ironclad case against homosexuality as such. So at best, these verses in Leviticus are ambiguous, and at worst, they're entirely irrelevant to the debate. Now, in both 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy, there is a serious translation error that we have to address. The word homosexual never appeared in the Bible until around the mid-1940s, 1946 to be precise. Um, up until that time, there was no tradition of biblical interpretation that saw in these texts the prohibition of homosexuality. And so there is a strong argument for calling this a mistranslation of these two texts. There is little to no evidence that the Greek word used in these verses was ever used to mean a homosexual identity in the surrounding culture. The language of the Bible has to be contextualized by its environment, and the fact that there is no evidence of this particular Greek word meaning homosexuality in any writing we know of from the time means that it is simply not what the word would have meant to Paul. The Greek writings we have from the period typically use this Greek word to mean many other things, such as weak, cowardly, soft, and what we might call loose in the ethical sense. Thus, it is again not a case of having anything to do with a committed homosexual relationship, but rather with a moral looseness or sexual perversion. And so the fact remains that the word translated here as homosexual never actually meant that to the original audience, especially not in the sense that we would think of it today. And so Paul either secretly means homosexuality, although there's no source for this, or the translators were letting their biased cultural opinion affect this translation. And I think that the history of this translation is enough to show that it is certainly the latter. Robert Ganus thinks that prostitution and pedophilia are again the most likely historical context for what Paul has in mind here. Or at least, he makes a strong case that, at the time, there's no way a loving and consenting relationship would have been what Paul had in mind because there was no historical evidence of this sort of relationship being the norm. 
And likewise, the scholar David Bentley Hart also notes the ambiguity of this word in his translation of both passages. He prefers to translate the term as men who couple with catamites, which is a reference to the first century practice of sexual relations between a master and a slave boy. So this again reaffirms the pedophilia reading. And so Hart also speaks more directly about why it's improper to translate this word simply as homosexual. He writes, It would not mean homosexual in the modern sense of a person of a specific erotic disposition, for the simple reason that the ancient world possessed no comparable concept of a specifically homoerotic sexual identity. Thus, honest biblical scholars of the text are those that admit that we really don't know what the word means or what specifically Paul had in mind with these two texts. But, however, what does seem clear from the historical context is that it could not mean simply homosexuality as a sexual identity as such, but at best some sort of act specific to the first century that we're not familiar with. But at most, we're just guessing at what Paul means. Um, now, finally, in Romans, there is some evidence that Paul is addressing the ISIS cult in Rome with his verse, um, which used homosexuality in its rituals. And so this is, again, about the Christian rejection of a cultural ritual and not of homosexuality as such. Um, and while this text seems to be the most direct critique, um, it's still not definitive. And furthermore, the text in Paul here in Romans is bound to his specific cultural conditions. We have to always remember that. So there is a case to be made here about reading this text in the similar way that we read other cultural texts like it, um, such as Paul banning men from having long hair and women from having short hair. No one today is seriously going around telling men that they cannot have long hair or that women cannot have short hair. But that is also in Paul's text, and it's presented in a similar manner. And there are also more substantial reasons for thinking this text indicates a cultural issue and not a blanket condemnation, even if the link with the ISIS cult can be proven false. Um, this has to do with the nature of the male-dominated relationships, which were the norm at the time. Um, the implications of Paul's verse seems to say that the true issue is not homosexuality as such, but the act of reversing the hierarchy so that a man becomes subservient rather than dominant. So in either case, the text, again, is not as clear, cut, and dry. It is ambiguous when you combine the cultural, historical, and textual context. So in all five of these texts, it is not so obvious that homosexuality as such is being condemned. It is far more likely from a close reading that there are some specific historical or cultural acts that the authors have in mind in these texts, which have little to no bearing on today's modern de debate. So we are simply talking about something entirely different than what these texts are talking about. Those of us who are LGBTQIA plus affirming are talking about loving, consenting relationships, not prostitution, pedophilia, rape, or whatever else these texts are about. I will link several of the sources for this information in the description, um, and it, it goes into a lot more detail. Um, but I do think that the scholarship is pretty clear about one thing. These texts are a lot more ambiguous than it has been taught by those who see in them a clear rejection of homosexuality as such. So while we can say it is still up for debate what exactly these texts are condemning, what is clear for most scholars is that these verses do not explicitly condemn homosexuality as such in the modern sense, but more likely some other issue that was culturally bound to that particular time period. In fact, on the question of sexual ethics in general, the Bible is far more ambiguous than we have been led to believe by the evangelical church. And this realization actually raises an important issue. In spite of the claim that the Bible has a clear blueprint for human sexuality, there's actually no explicitly stated biblical ethic for human sexuality. In fact, the Bible is quite ambiguous about sexual ethics, even heterosexual ethics. At time, the Bible seems to accept polyamory and even prostitution, while at other, other times it condemns it. And this strange ambiguity makes its way into the New Testament. Remember how the author of the book of Hebrews praised the prostitute Rahab in the famous chapter of faith, chapter 11, placing her alongside great heroes of faith such as Abraham. So the idealized image of a perfect Christian sexual ethic is simply a myth of evangelical Christianity. So does that mean that the Bible offers us no guidance today? No, I don't think that's the case, but my point here is that the Bible has less specifics about the actual individual form of human sexuality, and it has more specifics on the content of such relationships. 
There certainly is a call, a very clear call in the scriptures for fidelity and trust and for self-giving love in human relationships. The New Testament especially lifts up Jesus as our example for what it is to love one another, namely to lay down our lives for the other. But the how is often less defined than the what. In other words, the Bible is more ambiguous than evangelicals have led many to believe. I have found that the more closely I study the Bible for myself, the less and less I think that evangelical Christianity actually cares about discovering what the Bible has to say than it is interested in making the Bible conform to its own preconceived ideas. And so this is where we circle back to the importance of a liberating hermeneutic. Since the Bible is ambiguous about the issues of human sexuality, and because it is not ambiguous about the importance of liberating the oppressed, then the answer regarding the church's approach to the LGBTQIA plus community should be clear. By default, we should affirm and side with all oppressed peoples, including the queer community in their struggle for social, political, and sexual liberation. Our God is the God of the oppressed. The Bible is not ambiguous about that fact, nor is it ambiguous about the command to love our neighbors, proclaim good news to the poor, and liberate the captives. So when faced with ambiguity, we should lean on the certainties we do have about the gospel rather than trying to prop up our biases and bigotry with unsupported claims about some elusive biblical ethic that never really existed in the first place. These texts that supposedly condemn homosexuality are not so black and white. Even if my particular argument is flawed here, there are a number of other scholars making similar points, even conservative ones. The Bible is simply not so black and white regarding human sexuality. Thus, at best, the argument against homosexuality must ignore all of these cultural and textual challenges to their interpretation or find a way to work around them to turn their biases into God's law, and then to use that law to beat over the head the already oppressed communities. I say all of this to stress that the issue of an affirming or non-affirming position is more complex from the standpoint of biblical scholarship than whether or not someone simply denies the Bible or agrees with it. I do not think that one has to deny the Bible to affirm the queer community nor do I think that one has to challenge the Bible's authority as the inspired word of God. But I do think that we must not make the gospel of Jesus Christ into a message of repression and condemnation because we take a few isolated, ambiguous verses out of context and make them the center of our ethic. In fact, an argument could be made that those who use such texts to condemn the least of these are the ones who are actually denying the Bible itself. Because while they may have distilled out the letter of the law to its perfect minute detail, at least in their minds, nonetheless they have neglected the weightier matters such as love and justice. Now I do want to end this video with a brief personal account of my journey towards an affirming position. Um, I think that for me, actually meeting members of the LGBTQIA plus community and becoming friends with them has made the most significant impact on my thinking. Because I learned what it is to actually see God in another human being who shares a completely different background than I do, who does not act like me or think like me, but who nonetheless is a child of God worthy of love. Um, For me, this came about during some of my work experience. I worked at a fashion company as a salesperson for many years. Um, It's a job that I only recently uh, quit during the pandemic. Um, And it was one of the first times in my life that I've ever found myself to be in the minority. Um, I was a straight man working in an environment of maybe six or seven gay coworkers. Even while I wasn't the only straight man, um, I was typically in the minority. So this direct and sustained connection removed any sense I once had about queer individuals being objects of speculation or biblical debate. These people are not just an idea, but real human people. And I think this is really important for us to remember. The debate about LGBTQIA plus acceptance is a debate about the worthiness of real human lives. Evangelicals sometimes talk as if all of this is just simply ideological debate, like a game of chess or a math competition. But in reality, they fail to connect the issue with its real human effects.
the damage that the church has done to the queer community is clear and heartbreaking. We have not been good witnesses of Jesus Christ. We have rejected and excluded and condemned those whom Christ calls his own. And this reality stands against us as a condemnation of our empty services and rituals. As the prophet Amos records, God does not care about our empty rituals and ideological debates. God is concerned with justice for the poor and oppressed. I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. God is not concerned with splitting hairs over biblical texts that may or may not condemn homosexuality. At most, these texts are ambiguous and have little bearing on the current debate. And certainly, they should not outweigh the message of liberation and justice that is found throughout the Bible. Because what is not ambiguous in the Bible is God's concern with justice. That is why we must see the queer community not as objects in an ideological debate, but as real human persons made in the image of God and thus worthy of love and acceptance and inclusion. That is why we must be affirming, not merely in word, but also in deed. We must struggle for the liberation of the oppressed wherever they may be found. That is how we will be known as Christians, not by the complexity of our theology, but by the abundance of our love. The gospel we proclaim is a message of liberation, and that is why I think we must be affirming. You may disagree with the position that I've presented here, but I hope you can at least grasp the vital importance of fighting for queer liberation. Perhaps not as a religious person, but I hope at least as a human being, you can see the worth of their common humanity. Um, now, before I go, let me just say that because this video is potentially a controversial one, I mean, not potentially, it probably is, um, I do want to reserve my right to delete any hostile or condemning comments. Um, now, this is a rule that I've set up for all of my videos, really, but I want to make it more explicit here and just talk about it. Um, if you would like to make your own video or blog in response to this, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, but the comment section under my videos is not the place for your monologue. This is not your platform, it's mine. Um, and so I reserve the right to delete any comments. I do not want co-opting my work. As a friend of mine once said, shortly coming out as gay, I don't debate my humanity. Full stop. That is my approach to issues where real human beings are concerned. I don't debate the humanity of persons God has chosen to love. We can disagree about this or that text, this or that theology, um, but I draw the line at anything that furthers the oppression of the disadvantaged. Um, now, if you want to, if you have made it far into this video, I want to thank you so much for watching. I hope it's been helpful and informative for you. Um, and for those of you in the LGBTQIA plus community who have felt betrayed and hurt by the church, I sincerely hope that you know Jesus accepts you and loves you and celebrates you for who you are. And so do I. Thanks for watching and I hope you have a great day.